God shows Daniel the future governments that will come into play in his vision. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hember. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. That's what we read. We've been doing it for 33 years. It is exciting. In about five minutes, we're going to read Daniel 7, a fascinating scripture, and I encourage you to join us. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey? I'm going to be taking a look at Daniel's vision recorded in Daniel chapter 8. Ryan? Well, there's a lot that could be said about the book of Daniel, but today I'm going to be focusing on chapters 2 through 7 because they're designed and arranged in a specific pattern known as reverse symmetry, also called a chiasm. Very interesting stuff in Daniel. Janice, what are you doing? Today to follow God. All right, so take your Bible guide, get it out, open up the page. If you don't have a Bible guide, stay there. We'll tell you how you can get one. Open the most important book of all, that is the Bible, God's Word. And let's read what he says today. Daniel 7, 1 through 8. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9 are fascinating. As we begin to read about his visions of future events around 535 BC, it's a vision that unsettled Daniel greatly. Daniel was a man who was dedicated to following God in a time of great rebellion. But it was in this time that our Lord spoke to him about what would happen and when it would take place in the future. Now the night visions or the dreams that we read about in Daniel chapter seven speak about four great beasts or kingdoms that surface out of the face of humanity. Now, the first beast seems to be Babylon, who was like a lion with eagle's wings and given an image like a man. The second beast appears to be ancient Persia and is likened unto a bear. Now, the three ribs in the bear's mouth could be Egypt, Babylon, and Assyria. The third beast seems to be Greece and has the appearance of a leopard. And the fourth beast, which emerges out of the Roman Empire and never really dies, is interesting. From this beast comes the final leader who goes against the people who love God and who are able to dominate the world he is for a time. 
Now, this is absolutely fascinating and stunning. As we focus in this, we need to understand what God is saying. So take your Bible guide and turn to the page as we discover what's going on and learn about time has a limit. From Daniel chapter 7, time has a limit. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can get yours. We'll tell you how in just a moment, so stay there. But uh, the important part to remember is you can join us immediately. Uh, if you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the Bible page, it'll take you to a place where you can make a donation. Thank you so much for your donations in the summertime. We very much appreciate them. They keep us alive and keep us going. And actually, it'll take you to a place where you can download it exactly how we printed it. So let's pray about time has a limit. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to understand what that means. Time has a limit. It doesn't just go on forever. There is an end to time. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to perceive the aspects of eternity today. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, amen and amen. As we focus on this, we go to the first verse of chapter 7. Here is what it says. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts of the dream. Now, this is important. Keep this in mind. Daniel kept a record of what God spoke to him in his dream. Beloved, we must always keep our hearts turned to seek God and our ears will be tuned to him. Now, I need to tell you, this is very important as we focus on this. If we tune our hearts towards God, and we look to hear what God is saying and doing, then we need to position ourselves on a regular basis for hearing from God. One of the ways we do that is by reading the Bible. God speaks to me when I read the Bible and I hear him and he says things and I, it's just amazing. And so I hear the Lord speak. I hear the Holy Spirit's word speak to me. That's one way of hearing God. Another way is in prayer. When you pray, when you spend time with the Lord every day and go on a prayer walk or just pray where you're at, God speaks to you. So hear what your spirit says as it is encouraged and spoken to and motivated by the Holy Spirit of God. Very important. Now, there are many spirits in the world, but only the Holy Spirit of God is the one we need to listen to. Now, with that in mind, we go on to Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my visions by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. He says, God shows Daniel the governments to come. Nothing surprises God. Now, keep this in mind. When we talk about prophecy... We are talking about the kingdoms that have already been. Now, I, I would simply suggest to you that these are four kingdoms who have already been. And we're in the fourth now, because from this sea of humanity here, the beast rises up and there's only one left. And that is the one, one who comes from among the ten, who is, of course, the one who becomes dominant in the world. That's the Antichrist. Now, we are at the end of the kingdoms. We can see the other beast and all of that. So it's, it's, this is the other reason that I, when I read the Bible, I understand what it's saying, because God is telling us that we are in times that are going to change. And it's very interesting, and they are changing. So keep that in mind. Now, let's go to the last one, because this is good. Daniel 7, 4 to 8. The first was like a lion. It had eagle's wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it, and suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. And it was raised on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. And after this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads, four dominions, and it was given to it. After this, I saw 
in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. And it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. Now it was different from all the beasts that were before it and had 10 horns. I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up from among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and listen to this and a mouth speaking pompous words. Very interesting. Daniel saw the spiritual reality of the Antichrist. Daniel sees this. Now keep this in mind. This image is not new. It is ancient. This is not somebody's book I read from the 1800s. This is from about 400 BC. This is over 2,400 years ago, beloved. We have to understand that. And as we read the Bible and listen to the Lord in Daniel's prophecies, we understand that God continues to speak. And we see that. Now, today we pray and ask the Lord to help us because fortunately, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, we are not destined. Believers today are not destined to receive the wrath of God. But we are destined to receive the salvation from the Holy Spirit, praise God. And so that's what I'm looking for. But the future, boy, I'll tell you, it's a real big question mark right now. Very interesting how this is all going to develop. So let's keep that in mind. Father, help us today as we navigate this world to understand who you are and follow you instead of what everybody else is doing. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. So in Daniel chapter eight, we get this really interesting vision of Daniel. And I don't want to spend too much time going into the vision itself. I mean, chapter eight, if you read the whole thing in its entirety, there is an interpretation of the vision for you there. But in verse two, Daniel says something interesting. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. Why that's interesting is because archaeologists have extensively excavated the city of Susa and specifically the citadel of the city of Susa. Take a look. In modern day Iran lies the ancient city of Shushan, known as Susa in English renderings of the Bible. Susa is the site of the famous story of Queen Esther. Its palace was also home to biblical Nehemiah and was envisioned by the prophet Daniel. Excavated for almost 100 years, the site of Susa has revealed her ruined Persian palace and royal city, showing students of the Bible that the Book of Esther must retain eyewitness reports of its function and layout. Today, some of the decorative palace remains are stored in the Louvre, including a foundation inscription that records where all the luxury building materials were brought from. The royal palace of Susa was built by Esther's father-in-law, Darius I, known to history as King Darius the Great. Darius constructed Susa as a winter capital of the Persian Empire. Here, he constructed a massive 12-acre terrace upon which he built his monumental palace connected to the city of Susa by a large gate known in Esther as the King's Gate. To access the palace compound, one would have to cross a bridge over a river and walk through the King's Gate into a large courtyard outside of the palace. This system of the palace complex being separated from the city proper is reflected in the Book of Esther that distinguishes between the city of Susa and the citadel of Susa that should be identified as the palace complex. 
Inside the palace, the royal banquet hall has been identified. It was a pillared room whose elaborately decorated columns were 65 feet tall. This banquet hall saw the infamous feast of Xerxes when he drunkenly requested Queen Vashti's presence. It was also a main place of Nehemiah's work as cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. The very spot of the king's throne in this banquet hall has been identified by its stone base centered between the pillars of the room. The palace itself was organized in a more Babylonian style, incorporating three main courtyards that created a grand walkway through the palace on the way to the king's throne room. These courtyards would have been decorated with stone reliefs and glazed bricks, and they were separated by guardhouses. The Book of Esther indicates that the outer courtyard was the place that royal officials would come with their business and wait to be summoned by the king, as Haman providentially did. From the layout of the palace, it's easy to see that the king's throne located in his great hall or throne room would have had a direct line of sight to the inner courtyard, where Esther is said to have illegally come to request an audience with her husband. Esther herself would have come from the women's quarters, through the palace's middle courtyard, and into the inner courtyard, a route that can still be walked by modern visitors to Susa. So there we go, really interesting to take a look at the very hallways that Daniel had a vision of here, but would have visited in person as well, which is likely why he knew exactly where he was. Very interesting indeed. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. Ryan. All right. So today my segment spans Daniel chapters two to seven because there's something here that I really don't want us to miss. As if there aren't already enough amazing things in Daniel, these six chapters are arranged in a specific pattern known as reverse symmetry, also called a chiasm. Now, I have done a couple of segments in the past on this very interesting literary device, which is used quite often in the Bible, and you can watch or read those reports on our website, or you can watch them on my YouTube channel, which is just my name. But today I want to focus on these chapters in Daniel, because that's where we are in our Bible reading. So check it out. Despite the fact that the Bible is a collection of 66 books penned by some 40 authors over a great span of time and space, and in three different languages, it reads as if it's only one book by one author. Indeed, each individual book builds upon the last, progressively revealing God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. This unity of theme is one of the greatest hallmarks that the Bible is what it claims to be, God's word and personal revelation to us. Another hallmark of its divine inspiration is its high literary form. Though one might expect much of the Bible's literary style to be quite primitive, since many of its contributors were mere shepherds, farmers, and fishermen, God's Word is instead a literary masterpiece, even employing several literary devices. Some of these devices include alternation, immediate repetition, parallel symmetry, and reverse symmetry. Probably the most fascinating of these devices is reverse symmetry also known as a chiasm. A chiasm is an intentional literary device in which a sequence of ideas is repeated in reverse order, mirroring the original sequence in order to focus attention and highlight the center of the chiasm. Items in a chiasm are parallel, working toward the central point. Such repetition also serves as an important memory aid. Chiastic structures are prevalent throughout the Bible, and while some are limited to just a few verses, others span several chapters. In the book of Daniel, for example, there is a giant chiasm spanning chapters 2 through 7. In chapter 2 of Daniel, world empires are symbolized by four medals of a statue. In Daniel 3, three young men are delivered from the fiery furnace. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. In Daniel 5, Belshazzar is humbled. In Daniel 6, Daniel is delivered from the lion's den. And in Daniel 7, world empires are symbolized by four wild beasts. This chiastic structure clearly reveals the central point of these chapters, which is God's humbling of the prideful. But this particular chiasm also answers another question regarding the interpretation of chapters 2 and 7. 
As Dr. Mark Hitchcock notes, the chiastic structure reveals that Daniel 2 and 7 cover the same ground, employing different images for the same empires. Daniel 2 presents the four world empires from man's perspective as a great metallic man, while Daniel 7 views the same empires from God's perspective as wild, ravenous beasts. This is an important key for Bible scholars and students who wish to properly identify these four world powers. So then, far from being a primitive collection of writings, the Bible shows a level of literary form that suggests it's more than just merely the work of fishermen, farmers, and shepherds. So as you can see, the chiastic patterns are employed as a teaching tool. I mean, for one thing, they often reveal the central theme of the text, but they can sometimes also help us with interpretive challenges as it has here. Daniel chapters 2 and 7 cover the same ground. The nations in chapter 2 are the same as in chapter 7. And as I also mentioned in this segment, chiasms are also helpful for memory aid. Now, as I said earlier, you can watch my other segments on chiasms, including this one on my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Ryan Hembry. And they're also posted on our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And there's lots of my other videos and articles there as well. So please read, watch, and please share them with other people because we want to reach as many people as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, the word gospel means good news or the good news of Jesus Christ. That becomes important because that is good news, that sin has been dealt with by Jesus Christ. So that's very, very important. Janice. Yes. Well, I titled my segment today, To Follow God. We're going through the book of Daniel, and um, it's, a, it's a really interesting book. So much information in here. And today, in the August guide, we always have a prayer attached to the day. And the prayer was, Lord, help me to pay attention to your word and to wholeheartedly follow you. Now, uh, Rod focused on Daniel 7 today, which is the vision of the four beasts. And, um, you know, everybody has sort of touched on that. I want to take it in a different look. Um, oftentimes, you know, we can get tied up in what this means or what that means or what this vision is, what that vision is. But I want to take a look back and, and take a step back, even the chapter before, um, actually the whole book of Daniel, but the, the chapter before this one in six, Daniel is used in a plot to get him thrown into the lion's den. And that's the very famous story that most of us in, in children's church will remember and, and that a lot of people know that, that don't even follow the Bible. That story is very well known. But what we do see in Daniel is that he served and lived a life serving God wholeheartedly in this foreign place of Babylon where he was brought in as a Jewish captive uh, to learn the ways of the Chaldeans uh, their language, their politics, everything about them so that he could be in service to the king. But yet we see in Daniel's life choices that even though he was very high up in the ranking, uh, and, and I believe mostly because the kings of those times saw that Daniel had a very special ability which we know was the Holy Spirit of God within him. But we see this Daniel, a man of integrity, a man that knew he could trust in God. And even in this plot with, uh, with going to the lion's den, Daniel realized, it says here in uh, 6 verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, which means he had been accused of what, what he had done and he was going to be thrown into the lion's den. In his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Even when he knew that he was caught, even when he knew he wasn't supposed to live a certain way, his priority was not the priority of the earthly king. His priority was not uh, the direction of the way the Babylonians, the Chaldeans ran their society. His heart was attached to his God. 
His faith was in his God. And we see demonstrated even from the beginning of his time with his friends whose names were changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see even in their young lives, Daniel and, and his friends making a choice to step back from the, the ways that the king wanted uh, him to live and eat, uh, really with a test of, of food. Remember that story uh, where they were tested and they were found to be even healthier and better looking than those that were eating from the king's delicacies. We see over and over and over this lifestyle of following God. Daniel knew what this predicament was that he was going to be in, and yet he went to his upper room. So he didn't go down into a basement. He didn't close the doors. He opened the windows in his upper room where it was his habit. As we see, it was his custom since early days. They knew that. Those men knew that. And so I think, you know, as ourselves, we need to make that decision in our hearts. Do we follow the Lord God wholeheartedly? And you know why? That's a difficult question because it's easy to serve and follow the Lord, isn't it? When things are going our way, when things are looking prosperous, when we're living up here. But what about when things go south a little bit? What about when we're not well? What about if we're having economic difficulties? What about if we're being challenged by our society around us to be quiet about things? Where do we put our trust? Where do we and how do we live? Do we live in secrecy? Do we... um, put our dependence upon the things that we see around us or where the majority happens to be thinking, I think it's a good thing for us to ponder. So this prayer today, may it be ours, Lord, help us to pay attention to your word and to wholeheartedly follow you. Let's make that our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, today we pray and and we ask the Lord, Lord, help us to pay attention to your word, but to pay attention to your word with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our mind. For today, Lord, we desire to seek you with all of our heart, mind and soul. And Father, this is what we pray that we would gain the hunger and that it would grow as we go further and further closer to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and we said together, amen.